So as I was thinking about the text for this morning, I thought about how obsessed we are with time. And I've actually said the word time multiple times this morning. And as I thought about time and how obsessive we get with time, I Googled, I don't know why, but I Googled songs about time. Just wanted to see what would happen. There are hundreds of songs about time. People have written songs about time. There are modern day psalmists from Jim Croce to the Rolling Stones who sing songs about time. And if you think that it's only in this era that we have songs about time, you can go way, way back. And there are a lot of songs about time. So this is part of our human condition. Right? We obsess over time. We worry very often that we are going to run out of time, especially if we're trying to meet a deadline or a task that we're trying to complete. We often say, where has the time gone? Especially when we are looking back nostalgically at how our children have grown up and perhaps we are now becoming grandparents. We tend to think of time in a linear fashion. Many people, including myself, have a bucket list just in case I have enough time to do all the things I would like to do before I die. And then, of course, there's other people like me who are type A personalities. And every day we start with a list just in case 24 hours is not enough. Now, I know that some of you do that too. I'm not the only person that makes a list or has a bucket list or obsesses about having enough time. At the end of some of my work days, I actually will say, I did nothing with all the time I've been given, no matter how many hours I have been in the office. You know what I'm talking about. But the truth is, is that God has given us enough time for everything that is meaningful and important to do in our lives. God has given us enough time to build relationships. God has given us enough time to enjoy the life we have. But so very often we find ourselves chasing after things in our given time that either lead to great frustration or high anxiety. The writer of Ecclesiastes really understood this in a very powerful way. And so today I'm going to read to you from Ecclesiastes 3, those first eight verses. Many of you have already heard them. But we're going to explore, perhaps, what they have to say about time in a way different than we have thought about it before. So listen now to what the wisdom teacher has to tell us. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So just in case you are thinking, I know I've heard those words before, you have. You have. You see, in the 1960s, the psalmists called the birds made that into a very popular song. And for the past week, I have heard that song played in my head as I get up in the morning and as I go to bed at night. I have lived with that song. I mentioned to somebody out there earlier, I can't wait until I'm done with this text so that I can move on to another song in my brain. Um, but the truth is, is that here we have this really popular text that people so obsessed with time find absolutely fascinating. But the problem that we run into with this text is that it has nothing to do with the way we think about time. 
The ancient Hebrew people did not have a 24-hour day, nor did they have four seasons in a year. Their day was relegated by the rising and setting of the sun. If you go back to Genesis, you will figure that out when it says, the morning, the evening, the first day. See, they didn't have a clock on the wall. They didn't have 24 hours. They had the morning and the evening. They worked when the sun came up and when the sun went down, after they did whatever they had to do at night, they went to sleep and they woke up again when the sun rose. The idea of four seasons would never have made sense to them because this was an agrarian people. They were farmers. They lived by the cycle of planting, growing, and harvesting. So the idea that there was winter, spring, summer, and fall, that was not part of their world. It was not part of their life. So the writer of this text really is not talking about days and time the way we think about days and time. As a matter of fact, this would have seemed ridiculous to them because their obsession with time really had more to do with how they lived their life. You see, God is telling us in this text that all that you need has already been given to you. All the time that you need in the world has already been given to you to live fully the life that you have. As a matter of fact, the word time and season in Hebrew in this text has nothing to do with the clock. It has to do with God's initiative and our human response within God's initiative, in God's giving of time to us. The only part of the text that belongs to us is the choices that we make. Sowing and reaping, speaking or being silent, loving or hating, those are the things that belong to us, to the human being. The time belongs to God and God's initiative to give us life within that time. We have the ability to make choices in God's time. We call that time in the New Testament kairos, which is God's time, and human time is called chronos, think chronology. It's a chronological order. That's how human beings think. But the truth is, is that God has written us in to God's salvation story. See, we didn't write God into our story, into our time. God wrote us into God's time and into God's story. That's why life and death are part of God's time. Some of you have heard me um, offer a funeral homily here for a time or two, and, and in those times, I always start by referencing Ecclesiastes. More to remind us that it's really important for us as human beings to remember that we didn't write God into our lives. God was already in our lives. We just had to make choices about how we chose to live in God's time. And of course, there are always two choices about how we're going to live in God's time. We can either choose to live in God's will and to do the things that are pleasing to God, or we can choose not to do those things. We can live with small hearts and small minds and take care of only ourselves, or we can live with open hearts and open minds and take care of one another. And certainly, we all know people who fit both of those categories. And if we don't know them personally, we've seen those people since December 26th. After the tornadoes ravaged the Garland, Rowlett, and, and that area, uh, we saw people sacrificially giving of their time, their financial resources, to go and help in those places. We've seen people rescue pets, open their homes, serve meals. Just yesterday, a young girl was given back her ukulele that they found down the street someplace, and they knew who it belonged to, and so they returned it to her. We have seen the very best of human beings living within the time, no matter how tragic it is that God has given to them. But then we've also seen other people. We've seen people that have gone in after the tornadoes and have looted those homes that were left in disrepair doing further harm to people who are already suffering. All of those people, those who are helping and those who are harming, are all making choices about how they will live within the time God has given to them, 
how they will play out the story of their salvation in God's time, by God's initiative. You know, we are such busy people, and we are so busy chasing dreams and chasing the clock and chasing things that in the end will not bring us the full and abundant life that Christ has given to us, that I think that we have forgotten what this gift of time and life is really about. See, we were given all of this time so that we might enjoy the world and all that's in it, to actually stop and smell the roses, to watch the sunrise and the sunset and listen to the waves crash on the beach. We have been given enough time to live in community and build relationships with God and one another. We have been given people who love us and care for us. We have been given the gift of rest. When was the last time any of us actually rested? You see, there is enough time for all the things that make life full and abundant. But we always have a choice in that. Now, I don't think, and this might sound a little strange, but I don't think that the choices we have are actually choices about good and bad. I think for most of us in this room, and even for people who are watching online this morning, most of us know when a bad choice comes our way. And we know better than to choose the bad. Although I will say that for all the bad choices I've made, I've learned some valuable lessons over the course of my lifetime. And I'm hoping that some of you have learned valuable lessons by the bad choices that you have made too. I actually don't usually learn the first time. I usually have to make the same mistake and the same bad choice over and over again until I get that, you know, my behavior is not going to change unless I stop making those kinds of choices. But Jesus always had choices to make too. You see, the same choices that Jesus had to make are the choices that we have to make. They're not always easy choices. I think that the choices we have to make are between good and best. Not good and bad, but good and best. If you look at the list in Ecclesiastes, there's really no bad choice there. But there's always a best choice in that list. For some of us, a best choice might mean not taking the job promotion or going on to a new career until we finish our educations. For others, it might mean saying no to getting married right away until the baggage that both people are bringing into the relationship get worked out with a professional. For others, it might mean staying in a relationship so that the baggage that you've brought into the relationship can be worked out. For some, it will mean saying no to an opportunity in another place so that you can spend time with your family who perhaps you have neglected. We all have good choices, and all the choices might seem good, but there's always a better choice to make. Sometimes the best choice we can make is doing what's right in the face of great opposition. Jesus knows a little bit about that because Jesus always made the best choices in the face of great opposition. You see, Jesus chose to live by God's initiative in the time and the season that he was alive. He knew when to speak and when to be silent, even if he was just dying to speak. I mean, remember the story about the woman caught in adultery? Jesus could have said some really wonderful things to those holding those rocks. And instead, he drew in the sand. Jesus knew about building up and breaking down, about gathering people and sending them out. Jesus always had a choice. There was always a good choice and a best choice. And the good news for us is, is that we have the same resources available to us that Jesus had if we choose to live in God's time by God's initiative. We can make the best choices with all of the things that we've been given and the time we've been given. I think today, as we are entering into a new year, 
in a new time, we have the ability to make a covenant with God and with one another. I think that if we have the courage to say, we're going to live in God's time as the full, living, breathing people that God has called us to be, then we can wake up every morning and in faith say, today, God, I am going to live by your initiative, not my own. That I will seek the very best and not just what is good. Because now, right now, is the time for all of us to live. Thanks be to God. Amen.